Good morning. We're going to try at this time to cover uh, some information. We're going to try to move quickly because we're going to try to cover uh, several topics. So I'm just going to resume where we left yes in the last presentation. We were just we continue in the subject of Ezra 79. We have been looking into the third wheel, the first month, third day the fifth month. We did some simple calculations to see the correspondence of between these two calendars in the year uh, 1844. And we saw that the first day of the first month corresponds with what day in, in the Roy calendar. 19 of April, right? This is 18 of April was the last day of the year 1843, and then when April 19 arrived, that was the beginning of the year 1844. 1843 year had ended, and therefore disappointed settled amongst the believers. So this is the first disappointment, and I believe this is a significant point. Even though, if you're familiar with Millerite history, you will notice that most of historians place the emphasis of the first appointment on March 21st rather than April 19th. Mm. But I, I think it's pro probably because that was the original position that William Miller had. So we could say that between March 21st, uh, that's when Miller's disappointment came in, but then the Millerites continued waiting until April 19 came and went, and then uh, that's when the disappointment was finalized and confirmed. This was Amen. the real ending of the year 1843. And I believe this is important because I've seen, I know that some people want to continue holding to March 21st, but if you want to be accurate, if you make March 21st the beginning of your year and you count to the 10th day of the 7th month, it's not going to take you to October 22nd. It's going to take you somewhere in September, the 23rd or something like that. So, I believe if we want to be accurate, we have to consider this the correct day. This is the date that matches or gives the, the correct uh, you have to go that yes. the number of days. Yes. So this, this is definitely in my mind it's definitely and we confirmed that yesterday with a reading of quote by Joseph Bates, where he tells us that they consider the tearing time to begin at April 19. Uh, so that is confirmed. And we just want to see how August 15 fits into this picture. We know that this is the timing of the Exeter camp meeting. This is the time when the midnight cry was in power. But we want to want to just look some historical references for that. And um, go to your notes, please, on page 134 at the bottom. Page 134 under the heading first day of the fifth month, August the 15th. And this is a quote, okay, we already read that yesterday, so page 135, under the heading Exeter Camp Meeting, bottom of the page 135, this is from Arthur Whitefield Spaulding, written in the year 1961, and it says, the seven month movement rose to its height, to its first height in the Exeter, New Hampshire Camp Meeting, August 12th, through 17. So, this is telling us that the dates for that camp meeting is 12, 13, this is 14, 15, 16, 17. So it was a total of six days. And uh, men and families have come from all New England, from Maine to Massachusetts, and from New York and Canada. There was an anticipation that great things were to be revealed at Exeter, and all the people were in expectation. 
Joseph Bates, coming up on the train from New Bedford, Massachusetts, felt his mind impressed with the message, we are going to have new life here, something that will give a new impetus to the work. But he little anticipated in what dramatic fashion the life was to come to him. As one of the prominent ministers in the movement, he was given the pulpit on the third day of the meeting. So what day would that be? Third? 14th. The 14th, right? This is when Joseph Bates is going to receive the pulpit, or he's going to address a message. He was given the pulpit on the third day of the meeting, clinging devoutly to what? To that which he was, sorry, clinging devoutly to that which he was in after years to celebrate as the blessed Pope, he did was confused and made upset, uncertain by the spring disappointment. Nevertheless, he tried to do his duty by his people in presenting the evidences of the Lord's near coming and the expectation that they might soon see him in the clouds of heaven. So he is going to try to deliver a message to encourage the people. He himself is discouraged. So that's a hard task for him. There was no life in his message, we're told. Half, next paragraph. Half consciously, he noted a rider dismount from a painting horse outside the circle, come in and sit down by a man and his wife in the audience, and greet them with a few whispered words. The new arrival was Samuel Sheffield's note. His friends, Elder and Mrs. John Couch, suddenly Mrs. Couch rose up and interrupting the speaker, declared, It is too late, Brother Bates. It is too late to spend our time about these truths with which we are familiar. It is too late, brother, to spend precious time as we have since this camp meeting commenced. Time is short. The Lord has servants here who have meat in due season for this for his house. Amen. Let them speak and let the people hear them. Behold the bride will come and go ye out to meet him. Amen. Bates did not bridle. The meekness of the saints was upon him. Besides, he was ready for relief. Come up, Brother Snow, and tell us, he invited. Snow thereupon held a short question and answer service. And it was arranged that the next morning he should present the subject more fully. This he did in a powerful sermon on the midnight crowd, which he followed up with addresses each day that remained. So he's going to present a short question and answer uh, service on the 14th. And then he's invited in the next morning to present the subject more fully, and this is the powerful sermon on the midnight ride, where this takes us to the 15th of August. This is when the message is going to really be understood among the people. So this is confirming the date that our calculations have shown us already. And next page from... No, sorry, it's... It's in the same page in the bottom. It's this midnight cry. This is an account by historian Leroy Edwin Fruit from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, uh, Volume 4, page 813, page 814. It says Snow brought, brought out four points their correction of a previously recognized error in calculation had brought about the shift from 1843 to 1844. We have already explained that. The 70 weeks of years both began and ended in the autumn. This is something that we explained yesterday as well, that it is logical that if the cross takes place during the spring, and you count three years and a half is going to take you somewhere not in the spring but in the fall and if that's your ending point for the 70 weeks uh, and you count 490 full years is going to take you to the fall also and therefore uh, each of these periods have to be taking place in the fall because we're dealing with four years for this prophecy so the mosaic, no, point number three, the mosaic tabernacle types indicated that the second advent will occur in the autumn, not in the spring, but on the day of atonement, or tenth day of the seventh month, just as the slaying of the Passover lamb pointed to Christ's death on the fourteenth day of the first month. This was the fourteenth day. 
this was the 15th. Uh, the the way sheep resurrection and the allotted time for Pentecost all came on the exact days prophesied. So source now continued. He believed that the typical day of atonement will come on the exact day specified. So that was the conclusive logic he showed at the camp meeting. The next day, next paragraph, his presentation was repeated by request. So this is taking us. This is an account by the Roy Froom is telling us that on the 14th day he began his explanation, but the next day, the 15th, was repeated. His, the next day, but his, his presentation was repeated by request with greater clarity and detail. For example, since Christ was crucified in the spring of AD 31, in the midst of the prophetic week of seven years, three and one half years from the spring of 31, leads unquestionably to the autumn of 34. Therefore, the 1810 remaining years of the 2300, dealing with this period, calculated from the autumn of 34 AD must lead to the autumn of 1844. And this year, the specific 10th day of the 7th month coincides according to the Karia Jewish method of calculation with October 22nd on the Gregorian calendar. So, that is the special light that God unfolded for their understanding. And if you notice, just a quick comment. Since there was no specific verse in the Bible that pointed them directly, in Ezra 7 9, it just mentions first day of the first month, first day of the fifth month. Then, to arrive to this day, they had to. The argument was. Uh, they arrived to the understanding of the seventh day of the fall through the spring types, which means that they were using the principle of line upon line. Because these types were given originally to Moses 1,500 years before, and he was given the exact dates when these ordinances, had, where these feasts had to be observed. And these types were fulfilled perfectly during the line of Christ, as to the time and date. And so they took notice of that. They also were paying attention to the line of Ezra, because they knew that it had to do with the third decree. So they were applying all this knowledge of the types and the, the lines, the prophetic lines, they were bringing the information to their own line to their own history. So they were using the principle of line upon line, and this is how they gathered the evidence to point it to the Day of Atonement. So this was the midnight cry for them. It was line upon line as the Lord opened their understanding so they could see the, the day when the door was closing for the closing of their prayers. They were able to understand the closing of the information based upon the principle of line upon line. Okay, so now we want to move to the next topic that we want to cover. Since we are already dealing with this subject of the midnight cry for the 15th day of August, etc. camp meeting, go in your notes to page 144. Since we are already talking about the Exeter camp meeting, and we want to mention something that took place in history during that camp meeting. Hmm? And yeah. we have mentioned that it has been mentioned in the meetings, I believe, by Brother Jeff, that fanaticism manifested in the Millerite movement after the first disappointment, and it was quenched at the midnight cry. So this period is when fanaticism is going to appear and is going to uh, going to come to an end during this camp meeting. And we have a quote here from Sister White in the page 144. This is taken from Great Controversy. We will only read some excerpts from this. 
It says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. By the tearing of the bridegroom, it is representing the passing of the time when the Lord was expected, the disappointment and the seeming delay. In this time of uncertainty, the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver and their efforts to relax. Uh, but those whose faith was based on the personal knowledge of the Bible carry a rock beneath their feet, which the waves of disappointment could not wash away. They all slumbered and slept, one class in unconcern and abandonment of their faith, the other class patiently waiting until a cleaner light should be given. Amen. Yet in the night of trial, the later seemed to lose to some extent their zeal and devotion. So she's commenting on this tearing time, representing the passing of the time. And she continues, about this time, meaning great first disappointment, tearing time, fanaticism began to appear. Some who have professed to be zealous believers in the message rejected the Word of God as the one infallible guide and claiming to be by the Spirit gave themselves up to the control of their own feelings, impressions, and imaginations. There were some who manifested a blind and bigoted zeal denouncing all who would not sanction their course. They are now basing their impressions about their own opinions upon, the, upon their own opinions rather than relying and their emotions rather than relying upon the Word of God. And then she's going to compare this to Satan, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. This is spiritualism. But, and it says, And it is his spirit that inspires men to watch for the errors and defects of the Lord's people, and to call them up to notice, while their good deeds are passed by without being mentioned. And uh, she tells us in the book, Bottom, it says, in all the history of the church, no reformation has been carried forward without encountering serious obstacles. The enemy always tries to introduce counterfeits in, in or forms of fanaticism among God's people. It tells us also that William Miller had no sympathy with those influences that led to fanaticism because he was always combating them with the Word of God. And so we come now to the bottom of page 145. This is an account by James White. He's going to tell us how the fanaticism ended at the Midnight Cry, at the Exeter Camp meeting. This is taken from his book, Life Incidents, James White, page 153. Through 163, these are some excerpts, and was, this was published in 1868. Uh, it says, It was in the month of August, 1844, that the memorable seven, Second Advent Camp meeting was held at Exeter, New Hampshire. This meeting was large. There was upon the Exeter campground a tent from Watertown. I want you to Take notice of that name, Watertown. And it says, Massachusetts. There was upon the Exeter campground a tent from Watertown, Massachusetts, filled with fanatical persons, as briefly described above. At an early period of this, in this meeting, they attracted much attention by the peculiar style in which they conducted their season of social worship in their tent. These were irregular, very lengthy, frequently extending into hours of intermission and rest, continuing nearly all night, and attended with great excitement and noise of shouting and clapping of hands and singular gestures and exercises. Some shouted so loud and incessantly as to become hoarse and silent simply because they would no longer shout, could no longer shout, while others literally blistered, blistered their hands, striking them together. So these people were really extreme in the way they conducted their worship. The tents company from Portland, Maine, the tents company from Portland, Maine, of which I was one of the number, says James White, 
had pitched close by this tent from Watertown before the condition of those who occupied it was generally known. Little thinking of the annoyances that were to suffer from these fanatical persons. But this they, they endured for a while in the hope that they would be corrected and reproved. Seeing, however, that they were not the persons to be reformed, and that they grew no better, but rather worse, the Portland brethren moved from their tent to a distant part of the ground. But this act, showing the assembled thousands that we have no union with those we left, created sympathy for these fanatics. In not a few who view all the dangers of the way on the side of those who were disposed to formality. In other words, those who want to do things correctly. And uh, so this telling us that they have to distance themselves from this tent with fanatics. And, but many people didn't like that. And uh, this joined with the Watertown people in the cry of persecution and shouted glory to God over it as if a new and brilliant victory had been gained. So then he tells us that an elder, in Elder Plummer of Hagerville, Massachusetts, who had the special charge of the meeting, made appropriate remarks upon the condition of things with great solemnity and deep feeling. He then prayed, calling on God for guidance and help in that critical hour. He stated in the most solemn manner that it was time for them to stop. But if they would not change their course, it was time for all who wished to be consistent Christians to withdraw their sympathy from them and show their disapproval on their course by keeping entirely away from them. So, this is describing the events of the Exeter Camp meeting. This is where we understand the midnight cry was in power. So it's telling us that during these days of meeting, they had the disturbance of these fanatical people from Watertown. They were continually annoying the congregation. They were interrupting the speakers. They were doing all kinds of uh, distraction. And so Elder Palmer basically told them, if you don't cease, we're going to have to uh, withdraw all of our sympathy from you. <coughs> Several spoke from the stand, but they failed to move the people. Just then, as one was speaking with but little force and interest, and the people were becoming weary of being told in a dull process style what they already knew, a mage, modest appearing lady arose in the center of the audience, and in a calm manner, with a clear, strong, yet pleasant voice, addressed the speaker as follows. It is too late, Brother Bates. It is too late to spend our time upon these truths with which we are familiar, and which have been blessed, which have been blessed to us in the past, and have served their purpose and their time. The brother sat down and the lady continued while all eyes were casting upon her. It is too late, brethren, to spend precious time as we have seen, we have, so this is, she's introducing uh, brother Samuel Snow. Behold the bride will come in, go ye out to meet him. This testimony seemed electrifying and was responded by a hope utterances of Amen from every part of the vast encampment. Many were in tears. What former speakers had said was forgotten. This is talking about once we start addressing the congregation. He's telling us, and the spirit of fanaticism which an hour before lay upon the burdened feelings of the brethren and sisters like a ponderous leaden weight was also forgotten. The attention paid to those in fanaticism and the opposition they were able to call out were just the coveted few to feed the unhallowed flame. And they were destined to triumph unless the attention of the people could be fasted in another direction. This done, and their power was broken. By the request of many brethren, the next morning the arguments were given from the stand, which formed the basis of the 10th day of the 7th month movement. So that's taking us to the 15th day. And then it says, the speaker, Samuel Snow, was solemn and dignified and showed the entire satisfaction of the vast body of intelligent believers. Last paragraph, it tells us, but what of the Watertown fanatics? What happened with the Watertown fanatics? In the intense interest upon the subject of time, 
taken by the entire crowd, these were forgotten. No one seemed to be affected by them and troubled or troubled about them. In fact, they were quiet till they left the ground as a and as a dumb and as dumb as if the special rebuke of the Lord was on them. This fact that fanaticism dried up before the solemn and searching time of message of 1844, like the morning dew before the midsummer sun, is of importance to those who suppose that this stirring proclamation caused fanaticism. So, what he's telling us is the midnight cry is what could have made to fanaticism not only during this period, but in the Exeter campaign itself. He put an end to fanaticism. Now, you, in the next page, 147, you have a little, a little uh, a box that says the genuine and the false. So we're just being curious about the name Exeter, what it means. And Exeter, uh, the word Exeter, You know that it is a place here in England. It's an English place. It's, it's a, a place in England. This is taken from Wikipedia, from River X. This, the, this name is derived from, the, from a river in England called X. X. I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. It says yeah, this comment. The re this is taken from the Concise Oxford Dictionary of English Places and name, Names, page 171. The author is Edward F. Wall. It says, The river's name, River X, derives from the Celtic word Visca. I don't know how to pronounce this. This is the name. This is a Celtic word. I don't know. Uh, meaning simply water. So, except Ixka or this Celtic word means water. Uh, this river gives its name to the city of Exeter and many other settlements along its course, including Export, Up X, Nether X, etc. So, Exit means water, Exeter, and Hampshire is another place also in, in England. And because the place where this camp meeting was held was held in a place called Exeter, New Hampshire, in the United States, which is the, the northeast corner of the United States. And uh, so, but the original names are, these, these are names after locations in England. So Exeter means water, and Hampshire, you find the definition there. Hampshire, from Wikipedia, this is, Hampshire takes its name from the settlement that is known that is now the city of Southampton. Southampton was known in Old English as Hampton, roughly meaning village or town. So its surrounding area or city became known as Hampton. This is the root from which the term Hampshire, Hampton, Hampshire comes. So it, the root of this word is technically village or town. So what do you have there? If you put these two together, Exeter and Hampshire, you have water and town. And what was the name of the place where the fanatics came from? Water town. So what do we have here? I believe that this is not a coincidence. I believe that this is a counterfeit of the true water town. Exeter was the place where the water of the Holy Spirit began to be poured out. Here it had, it had been sprinkling on them, but when they came to August the 15th, to the Exeter camp meeting, 
once the fanaticism was quenched, the water began to pour down upon them. And this is symbolizing that during this period, there is going to be a counterfeit water town. There is going to be a counterfeit uh, of the latter rain. But this counterfeit will come to an end right here. This is, I believe, what this... Uh, this is first disappointment. The first disappointment of the 19th, April 19th, yes. on the onward, you have, uh, you have um, the first, uh, is it Hamanshire or is it the first place where you have fanaticism? The fanaticism is the right places between the first disappointment, which is April 19th, yeah. up to the August the 15th, mm -hmm. during the fourth day of the Exeter campaign, this is really going to happen. And this is, of course, typifying our time. In our time, the forms of fanaticism that we are going to select is not these straight forms that they were taking place here. It's not going to be the clapping of hands or the shouting. Or it's going to be a form of fanaticism that is deceptive enough to us. So it's, it's not going to be those same kinds of manifestations. Nevertheless, it's going to be a distraction for God's people and a snare for God's people. So, excuse me, yes. say the water came down on them after the The water came down? Yeah, what are you trying to do? Well, the water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So, the, uh, when we, tomorrow, Lord willing, we will have a, a study on the first day of the fifth month, you're going to see that in this first day of the fifth month, Ancient Israel is going to arrive to a place where there is waters, where there is uh, abundance of water. So we will, uh, we, we may comment a little bit more on that. We now are going to switch gears because we still want to be able to cover another topic. We're going to, in our notes, to page 121. Because now we want to start dealing with our timeline. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to erase this. We want to see the parallels between the Millerite timeline and our timeline. We are familiar, I understand most of us here, but I pray that some of this information may be of benefit, especially to those who are less familiar. Um, in, page, in page 128, you have a diagram. It's a little bit out of order in the, in the paging. But this represents the parallel between the Millerite timeline and ours. And we have been dealing during these uh, meetings with the reform lines as well. So we're going to try to see how the parallels between the line of the Millerites line up with our house. So, in the reform of the Middle Rights, we already pointed out 1798, it's when the king of the south is going, uh, is going to give a deadly wound Produce a deadly water to the king of the north. I like what brother Mark, Marco represents this. And uh, so this is 1798. Atheism is going to produce a deadly wound to the papacy. It's going to take the civil power away from the papacy. And this we mark as the arrival of the first angel. First angel arrives. We mentioned that there is an increase of knowledge. God raised an instrument 
and that was William Miller, and he received his credentials in 1833. We mark this to be the formalization of his message, the message God gave him, which was structured as a system of truth that God was going to use to test that generation. And then we mark August 11, 1840, the empowerment of the first angel. The first angel now is going to be empowered, which means it's going to be confirmed. God is going to use a prophecy of about Islam. He's going to use the second world is going to come to an end. Second world. Uh, And Islam, in this history, is restrained. Because if you remember, the second world is associated with a time period in which the four angels were going to be let loose for 391 years and 15 days. So at the end of that time period, they're going to be once again restrained. And this took place in August 11, 18. 40. That was the end of that period. This event had been predicted by using the year they principle by the, the Millerites, and this is what brought power to the Millerite movement. And then we uh, also mark the foundation in this time period, the 43 chart, the work of the enemies of the message, the resistance, was the Protestants began to, re to close their doors against the message in June of 1842. And the Protestants closed their doors, or begin to close their doors. And we mentioned that the, the turning point here, or the this is where the, this proclamation of the first angel's message is going to reach a climax here when the second angel is going to arrive. This is the point of the first disappointment that we have been marking here. This is April 19. April 19, 1844. This is the first disappointment. Uh, and this is the tearing time. And I read to you a quote where Sister White identifies an angel descending at that precise time. Uh, we, you have it in your notes. It's, uh, it's in page 143. It says at the bottom, as the time passed, those who had not fully received the light of the angel united with those who had... Oh, well, um, next paragraph. It's on page 144. The bold text says, Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the second angel. And uh, it says, Then I saw the disappointed ones again raise their eyes to heaven, looking with faith and hope to the Lord's appearing. But many seem to remain in a stupid state as if to sleep. Yet I could see the trace of deep sorrow upon their countenances. The disappointed ones saw from the scriptures that they were in the tearing time. So, uh, this is marking the tearing time. That, power, that angel that comes down is the second angel. The red angel of Revelation 14.8. And we also mentioned that this is where the, the Exeter camp meeting comes. These are the way marks of the parable of ten millions. Tearing time, midnight cry. Midnight cry is August 15. 1844, and then the closing of the door in the parable takes place on October 22nd, 1844.
So this is the mirror timeline. Now we want to focus our attention on our timeline. For us, the time of the end is when the king of the north, who had received its deadly wound, is going to retaliate against the king of the south. So now the king of the north is going to, uh, in Daniel, this is Daniel 11, verse 40, part A, Daniel 11, verse 40, part B. King of the north retaliates against the king of the south, that now is, uh, is no longer atheist friends, atheistic friends, but now it is this philosophy of atheism and communism is embodied in communist Russia. So this takes place in 1989. And just last month, I'm sorry, 1989, uh, the 25th anniversary of the end of the Cold War took place yeah. on, I believe, November the, the 9th, with the fall of the Berlin Wall was marking the end of the Cold War. And we know. It, when we have studied this history, we understand that the reason, how, the reason why the papacy, the king of the north, was able to overthrow communism in the Soviet Union was through an alliance, an unlawful alliance with the United States. And through this alliance, the United States became the armies of Rome. Because the papacy has no armies. In this history, the papacy relied, during the 1260 years, the papacy relied on the European nations to be her armies. In, yes, in this history, the papacy is going to rely initially or primarily in the, upon the United States of America. So, this is where 1989 is marking the time of the end for us. We should expect and increase of knowledge. And I want to mention at this point that all the reform lines and the sacred histories that we see in the Bible are there with the purpose of typifying this reform line, which is the last one. This is a sacred history just like any other. In fact, every other history is pointing to this one. This is the very special history where God is going to bring to an end all this great controversy on the earth. Amen. So, you should expect to see next that at this time, God will be choosing an instrument. An instrument that He is going to place this increase of knowledge and is going to move upon Him to understand this increase of knowledge, which is coming from Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And, uh, because these verses are predicting the resurrection, so to speak, of the papacy and how the papacy will place herself upon the throne of the world. So, God is going to, this message given by God is going to be formalized in the year 1996 when it is put together in a publication called The Time of the End magazine. And God, at this time, will have chosen His messenger and is the message that is to be carried to the house of Israel. And as this message is carried forward, we should expect to see an historical event connected with Islam that is going to empower this message, that is going to demonstrate or confirm the main premises of this message, just like it happened here. God used the first wall and the second wall, both have time periods attached to them, and during this Millerite period, time period, Josiah Lynch was able to calculate those two periods using the year day principle that was so unpopular among the Protestants at that time. He applied it 
to the history, and he was able to predict the exact time for the conclusion of this period. And when it came to pass, it confirmed it brought power. So God used the history of the first wall and the second wall to confirm the Millerite message for this time. So God is going to use now, a, in this art history, He's going to use the beginning of the third wall. This is the arrival of the first angel. This is the empowerment. The empowerment. Uh, first angel is empowered. This event this take, takes place in 9-11. In September 11, 2001, this is the arrival of the third wall. And the third wall, when we read in the Bible, is describing a succession of events. It is found right there in Revelation 11. Verse 14. Yes, uh, 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. This is marking the beginning of the seventh prophet. We understand took place in 18, October 22, 1844. But in verse 18, he's going to start talking about the woe, the third woe. And it says, And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. I don't believe I have with me the quote where Sister White comments on this, but she says that these these things, these events that are being uh, mentioned in verse 18. They are distinct and separate from each other, and they are successive. So the entering of the nations is marking this crisis at the end of the world that we identified in 9-11. And then the next event that is mentioned here is the wrath of God. This is talking about the seven last plague that are going to take place when creation is closed. And then it talks about the time of the dead, that they should be judged. This is talking not about the judgment of the righteous that began in 1844, but about the judgment of the wicked during the millennium. And then the time when the destruction of the wicked will take place at the third coming of Christ. So the third world begins here, begins here, and, and elapses throughout the millennium until the third coming of Christ. So this event begun to be fulfilled, the third goal, the arrival of the third goal, uh, began to take place in 9-11, because at this time you have the, uh, you have the restraining of the four winds, and um, your notes, you will find that in page 118. And you have a quote there. It says, this is from Life Sketches. We identify at this event. Angel of Revelation 18 came down. And It says this quote by Life, from Life Sketches, page 411. Now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by the tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said, as I look at the great buildings going up there story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no life in particular in regard to what is coming on New York. Only I know 
that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know the destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of His mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Sins will take place, the, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. So she's commenting on the event that will take place, the touch of the hand of the Lord, bringing down those massive buildings in New York. And this is, she is connecting this event with the angel of Revelation 18. Amen. So in this history you have an angel, Revelation 10 and 1. And in this history, you have another mighty angel that comes to power. This is the angel of Revelation 18, verse 1. And this angel, uh, when this angel descends, we find in Revelation chapter 7. My time is almost coming to an end. I don't have to Speed up. Revelation chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 and verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any, on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in our fortress. So this event, marked in Revelation chapter 7, is the restraining of the holding of the four winds. And four in this context means worldwide. It's marking a worldwide crisis that God, through His providence, is holding in check so that His people can receive the seal. And we have this quote from Manuscript Releases, Volume 40, 20, I'm sorry. Manuscript Release, Volume 20, page 217. It reads, Manuscript Release, Releases, Volume 20, page 217. Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold in the dead? All that we might have in our churches, the spirit and breath of God, Breathe into his people that they might stand upon their feet and believe. We need to see. Okay, so this is marking the restraining of the four winds and is telling us that it's represented as an angry horse. And we understand that association uh, with Islam, it's, it's clear. So these four winds are being restrained just as the four angels were let loose and afterwards restrained in this history. So we have, a, we have Islam here fulfilling its role in history. They are attacking the armies of Rome. At this time, the armies of Rome being the United States of America. So they are doing a work uh, against the armies of Rome. And they are going to create the environment as it has been already told to bring about the, the new world order. And uh, we want to read the quote from Great Controversy, page 611. And it says, uh, under the heading Four Angel, typified by the first angel, says, I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare to, for his separate appearing. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. 
I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn the men of, coming, of the coming wrath of God. This is talking about the first angel. Uh, this is talking about the first angel. And now, in Great Controversy, page 611, she's going to describe the fourth angel. And he's going to do it in a very similar fashion. It says, the angel could unite in the proclamation of the third angel's message. The angel could unite with the third angel. Is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here for the Pope. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844, referring to this history, was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. But she already, in context, she's talking about the angel that unites with the third angel, the fourth. So, uh, she is making a parallel between the fourth, or the angel of Revelation 18, that is going to parallel the first angel. And I believe my time is up, so we're going to, at this time, uh, end our presentation here, and we will try to complete the, the parallels. We're going to try to complete to see how this history is going to parallel to our history. So, with this in mind, I invite you to pray. Father, we bow before your presence. We are thankful because we recognize that we are indeed living in the time when the final fulfillments are taking place in history. And it is humbling to realize that among all the confusion in the world, you have seen fit to call us into this light, that we may have a definite understanding of what is taking place and what we are to expect and experience. But we will only be able to discern this increasing light if we humble ourselves and if we are willing to uh, be totally broken and use uh, and be filled with your Holy Spirit that you may be able to use us. Amen. We pray that you will continue to abide with us and continue to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.